Welcome to this video where we're going to be talking about why this is an alternate history channel. Not that we're trying to change history or alter history, but exploring have we actually been told the truth about where things were happening in the past. Let's get into the video. We said this playlist is going to be about dispelling errors and shining a light on bias. Let's try to do that with this comment. We were a little bit critical the first time we looked at this. We're going to focus on this part when it speaks about Semitic and also Ham. It says Semitic means Asian. If you think about this in terms of the language, it says it's an Afro-Asiatic family. So that's the first thing is we're missing the Afro part here. Then it says all Asians are the descendants of Shem. Now that might not be completely false, but is it too broad a statement? We're going to investigate that. I think if we go to a map, we've used this map before on the channel. I think this map reflects what the viewer is saying or the belief of the viewer because we see Shem is going to be strongly connected with the regions going from the Middle East towards the East. So it will be Asia and Ham with Africa and Japheth with, with Europe. So I think this traditional view or the accepted view of biblical scholarship for the three sons of Noah will connect with this comment. But we're going to consider something different. And we're going to do that by thinking of the land of Shinar from the Bible. We have these different variations. We're going to focus on this one from the Septuagint where it says Senar. Now other researchers were aware of this and brought this out before this channel even started that we have regions in ancient Nubia called Senar and this will be the modern day country of Sudan and we still have regions of Sudan carrying this name Senar and we see that's very similar to this variation from the Septuagint so what we're going to do is we're going to create a map, our own map to work with. It might be a bit small, but we can see that we have Shinar here on this map. We're going to put it in a different place where we just saw on that map of Africa in the ancient territory of Nubia. With a question mark because we're asking, we're investigating. This is, this is important for our learning that we are aware that there is scholarship that connects the land of China of the Bible with ancient Sumer. So that's why if we look at this map, we see China here in the modern day country of Iraq, because we are told this is the land of the Sumerians. So this is where biblical scholars are going to be looking for the land of China. But we are now considering a different region because of what we can see on this map. But when, when we do that and we put this on our map like this, we're considering something different. So now the channel is going to become an alternate history channel because we are considering something different. We're going to build this map and see what it looks like. We're going to work with a very interesting source, the Book of Jubilees. So we are actually using other sources to to support what we're going to say. Let's build this map together. We're going to build this map by interpreting the Book of Jubilees. It is a work from the Apocrypha, but it does have very interesting information about the three sons of Noah, the lots that they received, and then how they divided that 
amongst their sons, which will be the grandchildren of Noah. Let's read the portion that came for Ashur, a son of Shem. And for Ashur came forth the second portion, all the land of Ashur, and Nineveh, and Shinar, and to the border of India, and it ascendeth and skirteth the river. We're going to focus on the part where it says that the land of Shinar fell for Ashur. We can now think about this for our map, that the land of Ashur is going to incorporate Shinar. So I'll put that here. This is important for us to consider and think about when we know well, we know now that there are scholars that connect the land of Shinar with Sumer, that we should be thinking this is the territory of the Assyrians. Now we're also going to put Elam on the map. So if we, I don't want to read the whole portion for Elam. We focused on this detail here that the whole land of India came for Elam. I'm not going to go through all the sources again, but I'll show you the video if you, have, if you haven't seen this yet. Who could the Elamites be today? I'll put this link in the description below if you want to see the, the sources that we used and learn about that. So this is, this is an interpretation. We're going to put Elam in this region. I think it I think I will have to um, give one example so this video does make sense on its own we were learning about the perspective of the Greco-Roman world how they viewed these regions and that parts of East Africa were called India and we read that one source of how the Nile River was flowing out of India into Egypt from one of those Roman sources. So to the Greco-Roman world, as you're coming towards Sudan, coming towards Ethiopia, you could view this as India. And that's important for our learning and our understanding, especially when we come to work with the Book of Jubilees, because if we go back to Ashur, it says how this territory of Ashur reaches to the border of India. But that means it's going to be connected to the land of Elam because it says the whole land of India fell for Elam. So that's very important because if we take this back and think about how we're learning that the territory of Ashur reaches to the land of India, then this might not look right. Because then you're going to say, well, the modern day country of India is very far away. This is not looking very realistic. And maybe the, the map that we started with might make more sense if we go back to this map. Because we have Ashur here in this interpretation. And then you could argue that that might be more realistic to reach towards the border of India. So that's why it was important that we discovered those sources with parts of East Africa being called India and even the modern day country of Yemen. So that this actually does make sense that the territory of Ashur can reach towards the, the portion of his brother towards Elam. So now we have something to work with, to think about. If we go back to the comment, how it says Semitic means Asian, but we said already that we could be missing the Afro part here. And all Asians are the descendants of Shem. Already we now have something different to consider for the Shemites, because we've got two brothers and with our interpretation, both of them are on the continent of Africa. 
I would also like to put three of the sons of Ham on the map to see that with our interpretation of the Book of Jubilees, it doesn't affect the sons of Ham. Let's do that. We're going to start with Mizraim, son of Ham, because when you're working with the Book of Jubilees for the Hamites, you need something that you're sure of to begin with. We've learned that Mizraim is the Hebrew and Aramaic name for the land of Egypt and its people. So we can be confident with this one and put Mizraim for Egypt. Now if we go to the Book of Jubilees, we can interpret it because it says and Ham divided amongst his sons and the first portion came forth for Cush toward the east and to the west of him for Mizraim. So now because we've already got Mizraim on the map we can then place the other sons of Ham because then it says and to the west of Mizraim will be put and if we go to the work of Josephus, we can get confirmation that Put was the founder of Libya. So we do have another source that is confirming that. So we can put Put on the map for Libya. Now, the ancient territory of Libya has changed over time. It may not be the same as the modern day country today, but just roughly speaking, we're going to put put here for Libya. There are also connections and theories about put and the land of Punt, but because we get this confirmation from Josephus with Libya, it makes sense to have it here. Now we're going to work with Kush. It's said that Kush was toward the east. So he's going to be toward the east of his brother Mizraim. Now if we go to the map that we started with for the sons of Ham, we notice they have Kush here, which makes sense because this is the land of Nubia. We we have seen maps showing this as the kingdom of Kush. So this makes sense to have it here, but this is to the south of Mizraim. And the Book of Jubilees is saying that Cush was towards the east. So this is why that source was very interesting. The wonderful Ethiopians gives us lots more to think about for Cush. This chapter 8, Arabia and her ancient races. It says, Arabia was once a portion of the ancient Cushite Empire. Some authorities claim that it was the original seat of Ethiopian culture. And if we just read one more part, the Kushites were the original Arabians and dwelt there before Abraham came to Canaan. So it could be important for our perspective that we should consider Arabia for Kush as well. And when we think about that with the with that source that we read from, the wonderful Ethiopians, then the Book of Jubilees can still be accurate and trustworthy when it says Kush was towards the east. And we could also ask how far to the east you know, did the Kushites you know, spread out? But we do know that Kush is strongly connected to this region, both sides of the Red Sea. But I'm going to put Kush here so that it makes sense with the description from the Book of Jubilees. Now I've left the fourth son of Ham, Canaan, out of this because that gets a little bit more complicated to try to explain. But it does say here that Canaan dwelt to the west of Put by the sea. So that would be coming towards the modern day countries of Morocco, maybe Mauritania, 
So the land of Canaan was supposed to be in this region, northwest Africa. But we also learned from the Book of Jubilees that Canaan preferred to live in the land of Shem. So I'm just going to leave that out for now because it requires more exploration and I just want to work with this at the moment because what we can see with what we've done so far is that the, the sons of Shem doesn't interfere with the way Jubilees describes the portion for the Hamites. It could be very important for us to consider now if we go back to that map because we've been given this perspective that Ham is connected strongly with Africa. When we think about the with the Bible, we think Ham, we think Africa, and that's what was said to, said to us here in this comment, where it says, Ham is the son of Noah, who is connected to the people of Africa. And when you when you have these statements like this, it seems conclusive that Ham, well, should I say that Africa is only connected with Ham, but is that really the truth? That's what we want to try to discuss so that we can try and learn and shine a light on things that are false, errors, and also bias, because we could see now that the Shemites could also be strongly connected with Africa, and that completely changes our perspective. Because our picture is different from the accepted view, we should be looking for sources and information that actually works with this picture. And we just read something very interesting in one of our previous videos from the source, The Wonderful Ethiopians. It says, The Greeks looked to old Ethiopia and called the Upper Nile the common cradle of mankind. Toward the rich luxuriance of this region, they looked for the Garden of Eden. So according to this source, the Greeks were looking for the Garden of Eden, but where were they looking? So it's saying they were looking towards old Ethiopia, toward the Upper Nile. So coming into the modern day countries of Sudan, coming towards Ethiopia. But the interesting thing is the information we get from the Book of Jubilees, because it speaks about Noah rejoicing for the portion that came for Shem, and that's the whole land of Eden is in the territory of Shem. So if you're looking for the land of Eden or the Garden of Eden, according to the Book of Jubilees, you'll be coming towards the territory of the Shemites. And this source is saying that the Greeks were looking for the Garden of Eden and coming into the Upper Nile region. So if you think about that with our picture, it actually works and makes sense because you would be coming into the land of the Shemites with our map. And that's what we try to do is look for sources that can support and work with this picture. Let's share another one for this video that we came across for the Assyrians, for Ashur. This could be a very important source, an Assyrian successor state in West Africa the ancestral kings of Kebi as ancient Near Eastern rulers. You can see the author's name. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Don't want to get it wrong. Let's read something from the abstract. It's very interesting. On the basis of newly discovered documents in the house estate of Kebi, Nigeria, the present article argues that the foundation of the state was the result of a conquest by Assyrian immigrants towards 600 BC. This would be the period of the downfall, the destruction of the Assyrian Empire. Let's read one more part. From the names included in the long list, it appears that the early kings of the Kabawa were ancient Near Eastern rulers, and that the author of the list believed in a continuity between Assyria and Kebi. This is very interesting. Let's go to the map that's given in the source so we can speak further. It's going to show us the migration. 
So we see that the migration is starting in this region, towards the Middle East, where we are presented and taught about the Assyrian kingdoms and the Assyrian Empire. But we are considering a different picture. So we're now going to relook. Do we have to relearn and reconsider the ancient past? And when we come across a source like this, it could even give us, we could say, like a radical, a radically different perspective on the ancient world. So a few questions come to mind. If we use this map, when the Assyrian Empire is collapsing and being destroyed, where did the Assyrians go? They could have migrated into many different re regions. There's different ways they could have gone. If this study is true, why would they come all the way to West Africa? Why choose West Africa? And when you start to think about it, it raises more questions because how many people are aware that there could be Assyrians in West Africa if the study is true? There could be large amounts of people in this region that might not even be aware that they are Assyrians, maybe have lost their identity. And another thing to consider would be the fact that they've managed to be successful in this region. Could you really distinguish the, the Assyrians in this region? So it does start to give you many things to consider. So it doesn't support the way we have this laid out, but it does give us something to think about for the ancient Assyrians, for the empire, for the people. What really happened to the Assyrians? Where did they migrate to? And if it's true, the study that there, or you could say there are Assyrians in the modern day in this region, should we actually reconsider what we've been taught, what we've been presented and maybe this map could be proven to be correct. We know that Nimrod is going to be important for the land of Shinar. It says, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel in the land of Shinar. But we're asking something different for the land of Shinar with our map. Do we have information or sources that could show Nimrod being in this region, which would be important? If we go to the page on Kosh, we have interesting traditions that were discovered, found by the explorer James Bruce. Interesting traditions among the Abyssinians that the family of Kosh after the flood traveled up the Nile River until they reached the Atbara Plain and they built Aksum. And this is a very interesting tradition that was uh, rejected by European scholars because they had their own theory of how Kush must have arrived in Africa. It also speaks about an obelisk being erected by Kush in order to mark his allotted territory. Very interesting when you think about that with what we've been reading from the Book of Jubilees. And also that there speaks about a son called Ethiops. So we also will speak about that. If we think about the these traditions, if we use Kush and we think about the family of Kush traveling along the Nile River and building the kingdom of, kingdom of Aksum in this region, I'll put a map in this video so you can see. But we know that Nimrod was in the family of Cush. So if this is where Cush and his family came after the deluge and they're founding a kingdom in this region and if it's true that there was an obelisk erected by Cush to say this is our territory, then we would have traditions bringing Nimrod into this region where he could then 
found his kingdoms. So that was also very interesting that it could um, could support this this map we're building. One of our viewers, Bethlehem Heat, sent us this comment asking about the name Ethiopia and the way it's been used. A very good question, but we've got something else to consider now, because what about if there was a son of Cush called Ethiops or Ethiopus? Let's first think about what we've been told and the way this name has been used. For those of you that don't know, Ethiopia in the Greek means burnt face. And it says that this has been used as a vague term for dark skinned peoples. So it has been used in a vague way. But then it also says that Herodotus used this to refer to parts of sub Saharan Africa that were known to the Greeks at the time, specifically all inhabited land south of Egypt. So the fact that it's south of Egypt could be significant. So it could be a case where there could be some historians or geographers that are using this name Ethiopia in a specific way, which we'll speak about, but then others using it in a very vague, broad way to refer to dark skinned peoples. So it may have been used in different ways, but what's the, the native origin for the word, sorry, for the name of the country? That could be interesting. And that will be connected to Ethiops, a legendary king, a son of Cush. Does this make sense? Because if we think about how in the Bible, Cush has become Ethiopia, says you when it was translated to the Greek in 200 BC. So why is Cush becoming Ethiopia? If we think about the son of Cush being Ethiopus or Ethiops, then it can make sense how Cush can become known as Ethiopia. And were there some historians or geographers that understood the genealogy and knew that there were Cushites or Ethiopians to the south of Egypt? So that would make sense. But then I came across something interesting on the page for the Greek god Zeus. Titles for Zeus, or a surname it says here, Ethiops, meaning the glowing or the black. So why, why is Zeus, or why was Zeus given a surname or a title, Ethiops? This will connect, if you've been following our videos, to this video, who could the Greek god Zeus be in the Bible? I'll put the link to this video in the description below if you'd like to watch that because these details could be important to understanding this picture with Kush and Nimrod. I don't know if that helps Bethlehem Heat with the question, but it is important for the way we think about Ethiopia. We came across some other interesting information as well about Ethiopia how it could connect with Elam. But I think we've got a lot to think about for this video already. Maybe we can continue to recap and continue to build this map as we, um, as we continue to think about this playlist as well, because we are in this playlist, the origin of civilization. And we'll try to think about this playlist with what we've done in this video as we go into our final thought. For our final thought, we're going to be thinking about our playlist and this debate of the origin of civilization. I just typed this into Google, where did civilization originate? And it speaks about these cradle civilizations, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Indus Valley. And then it also speaks about China coming later and then Central America. But no mentioning of Kush. But the Bible in Genesis 10 is making special mention of Nimrod that Nimrod 
found a kingdom in the land of Shinar and also a builder of cities, even the great city Nineveh. So if we're thinking about the origin of civilization, should we not be looking to Cush? And maybe it is mentioned here, but we just don't understand or we can't see it. Thank you for watching this video. Let me know what you think about the, the picture, the map we're building. Hopefully we get a chance to continue to build and share what we've been learning and finding on the channel. Thank you also to those that share comments to try help to share what they've learned. Thank you to those that like the videos. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you in another one.